360 TV proudly presents Messages of Inspirational Stories. Broadcasting and live streaming to millions of devices around the world, including Roku. And live streaming to Facebook Live. Also on Amazon Fire TV. And to Twitch. Also, Android TV and Periscope. Broadcasting to Apple TV and YouTube Live. Proudly brought to you by our host, Donna Guinoa, producer and host, Michaela Vidal, host and administrator, and Jim Grant producer and host proudly brought to you by the six minute webinar.com good afternoon everybody and welcome back to the messages of inspirational stories jim i am super excited about this week we are going to be talking about the roaring 20s and how oh, yeah. you can learn and grow from it oh yeah because we see that history repeats itself over and over and over again. And the Roaring Twenties, you will see how it's very connected today as far as similarities and principles. Because right. right now we got a war going on between Russia and Ukraine. We've had a pandemic our own selves. And people everywhere are tired of the nonsense. They're tired of the doom and gloom. They're tired of just living in survival mode. Right. You and know, living in fear. Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've lost sleep at night. We're going we to have enough toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, realistically, goodness. when you look at the history of the world, and we're going to look at, at the Roaring Twenties, the, the period right before that, how people just got fed up with doom and gloom and bloodshed. Let's yep. call it what it is. And World War I was the... Uh, the beginning of all of this nonsense. And that was created by the assassination of Archduke, I'm trying to remember his first name now, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He was the uh, heir presumptive to Austria and Hungary a throne, and his wife Sophie, the Duchess of Hohenberg, they were both assassinated on the 28th of June, 1914. And that was the beginning of the catalyst of the war, World War I I'm speaking of. Mm -hmm. That's what tempers flared up about. And, you know, when we talk about war, you know, I've often said this. War is generated by three things. Money, power, control, and it's fuel with greed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I know a lot of people think that the uh, Civil War, which really was a war between the states, was over slavery. It Slavery was a catalyst that got people involved. The real thing was over in the southern states, you know, walking away. Uh, what they call it? I forget the name. But anyway, they pull them back from the, the union and they created their own money. Right. Because they Abraham had their own government. Yes, yes. They Abraham had their Lincoln. Own branch of government at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they had their own power because Abraham Lincoln. You can Google this. He actually quoted to Horace Greeley of the New York Times, because Greeley asked him, says, "If you could stop the war and not free the slaves, would you do it?" And he said, "Yes." And the reason why people don't go to war over something like that. As wrong as it is. Now, let me say this about slavery. Slavery was wrong on all fronts. Absolutely. From the Africans to that sold them, the slaves to the Americans that bought and Europeans and other people that bought them. That was just wrong, wrong, wrong. Right. And it's a horrible thing. It's an ungodly thing. And I'm glad it I'm glad it was, you know, came to an end. But rest assured of this. Nobody but nobody goes to war over poverty. Right. You want to know why? There's no money in it. 
exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way this world turns. And that's, that's how come we see all these wars and things going on because it's all about money, power, control, and it's fueled with greed. Right. My goodness gracious. And World War I broke out. And I want to just share a little bit about World War I. Uh, it broke out in uh, 19, uh, the conflict started July, they say 28 July 1914. That was a day that the Archbishop and his wife, Sophie, got uh, assassinated. And it ended on 11 November 1918. And the United States got involved with it, World War I. And, you know, you can read up about the history of the war, but that was what we were, was dumped in our laps mm -hmm. for society to live with. Just like all the negative things we hear now about Russia and Ukraine. That's what's been dumped on the laps of people around the world and how we deal with it. And all you of know. them are a tragedy. Yes, ma'am, they are. And uh, Every one of them. all of them, too, could be 100 percent avoidable. All of them, too, could be 100 percent beneficial for both parties if they sat down like mature adults and discuss, discussed it coming from a heart of love rather than money, power, control, and greed. Greed. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I get an amen on that? Amen, <laughs> I, brother. Amen. I promise I, I promise I won't pass a collection plate. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the catalyst that started us into World War I. Mm -hmm. So people are, you know, obviously Americans and people who are involved in the war, they're losing loved ones. Right. Over this money, power, control, fueled by greed. Let's call it what it is. And, and there then, hasn't uh, been a war since the dawn of time uh -huh. that, ha that we haven't lost loved ones. Oh, yes. That we haven't had family fighting against mm. family. Mm. You know, I know in the Civil War, I had family on both sides. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, yeah. you know, there it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and of course, I'm from North Carolina. Our records are so sparse, and so we, we went, our family history is mainly recorded in Bibles. Right. And uh, to be honest with you, because I, I don't know if we were involved in the Civil War or not, or if we had relatives on both sides, because a lot of families had relatives on both mm -hmm. sides. Absolutely. And that is so sad. And even a lot of, there were some black uh, soldiers that fought for the South. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was just it was just a horrible thing. All wars are horrible. I'm a Vietnam veteran, so I can speak from experience about that. Mm -hmm. And my son is a veteran. He has served in Afghanistan, Iraq. He's been multiple tours of duty over there. He's oh, yeah. been awarded my the father, bronze. My father, I come from a family of military. Korean War. Yes, ma'am, you do. Went through the whole Vietnam era. I yeah. mean, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. And my son was awarded the Bronze Star. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we're not just sitting on the side and looking at it from a perspective of being an, an observer. Right. We, we got skin in the game. And that makes a huge difference. So that's why I speak out about wars and the harmful things it does. The tragedies of war. My oh, gosh. absolutely. Ooh. And unfortunately, the tragedies of war, Jim doesn't end when the war ends. No, ma'am. It no, goes on. It goes on and on. And there, mm. you know, are parts of our world that are still in a, a dilapidated mess oh, yeah. from, oh, yeah. from wars. Mm -hmm. And look at all the children throughout, you know, from various wars who've been, you know, very seriously injured or killed from landmines. Or orphaned. <laughs> Yeah, or orphan. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But that was what people around the world were dealing with in the United States and other places, Europe and so on and so forth. And then, Donna, they had another thing dumped in their lap that was no fault of anybody. It just no. it just knocked on the door, came in and says, here we are. Here it is or whatever. Right. So right <laughs> as the war was ending in 1918, Mm -hmm. The influenza pandemic, also known as a Spanish flu, mm -hmm. or it's also known as the great influenza epidemic hit. Right. Now, it is caused uh, back then by the H1N1 influenza A virus. Does that sound familiar? 
<laughs> right? So, you know, this virus has been here for, a, you know, such a long time. Oh, yeah. But the earliest documented case was back in March 1918 in Kansas in the United States, mm -hmm. with further cases recorded in France, Germany, and the United Kingdom in April. Two years later, just two years, Jim, nearly a third of the global population or an estimated 500 million people had been affected in four consecutive wave, waves. Mm. Estimates of death range because they didn't really have great records back then. Mm -hmm. So again, this is an estimate, but somewhere between 17 to 50 million and possibly as high as 100 million making it one of the most deadly pandemics in human history. Mm. Right. You know, as you're, as you're mentioning that, Donna, the thing that came to my mind, the first recorded case was in Kansas. And then it started getting, it was started hearing about it from Europe. Was it France or whatever? Yeah. France, uh, yeah. Uh, Germany and the United Kingdom. Yeah. Now, now remember folks back in those days, <laughs> they didn't have international flights. <laughs> right you know, carrying people here and there and spreading disease. So it's kind of interesting how that rascal just got, I don't guess we really know how it got. No one really no. knows, to be honest with no. you. It just goes That's to show you. Yeah, there wasn't really good records at that time. Mm -mm, not at all. Not at all. And uh, it, it's just amazing because it, people during that time, think about that. Think about where they came from. And I'm going to let Donna talk a little more or anything what she wants to about the Spanish flu, as long as uh, we don't get it. And uh, <laughs> I'm teasing her a little bit today. I'm teasing her, bless her heart. But we can easily see coming out of World War I and then having this Spanish flu dumped right Oh, it was you. just massive, Jim. It, it was, was massive. It was frightening. It was because frightening. We it was. We didn't have the medicines. We didn't have the, mm -hmm. the science, the knowledge behind it that we do mm. now. And it goes on to say that the uh, most influenza outbreaks killed the young and the old with a higher survival rate in between. But the pandemic had unusually high mortality for young adults. And scientists offer several explanations, including a six year climate anomaly uh, affecting migration of disease vectors which increased likelihood of spread through bodies of water. The virus wow. was particularly deadly because it triggered, if I can say this right, so if I can't, forgive me, mm -hmm. um, psychotine storm ravaging the stronger immune system of young adults, although the viral infection was apparently no more aggressive than previous influenza strains. Uh, malnourishment over crowded medical camps and hospitals with poor hygiene, exasperated by the war, promoted mm. bacterial super infection, killing most mm. of the victims after typically prolonged deathbed. Mm. So it's, wow. it goes on, and I'll just finish up here. Sure. The 1918 Spanish flu was the first of three flu pandemics caused by the H1N1 influenza A virus. And the most recent one, uh, of course, this is this article is a little bit older, was a swine flu in 2009. Mm -hmm. And then in 19, that was uh, in 1977, the Russian flu was also caused by the H1N1 virus. And of course, mm. you know, COVID is H1N1. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. you know, but thank, thank goodness, thank goodness that mm -hmm. uh, it, we're ad advanced where we are today and we mm -hmm. can combat things a little bit better. Amen. And this gives us a clear snapshot of how people were, what they were faced with. Correct. And you could understand that they were sick and tired of living in fear. They were sick and tired of living in this survival mode. They wanted to thrive. Right. They wanted to live because, my goodness gracious, uh, you know, who wants to live with the threat of death, you know, knocking at the door? Right. You get and one tired of, the, of it. Absolutely. And one of the things back then that was also, um, I believe, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, 
was a cause was in that time period, we did not have the hygiene that we do today. Mm -hmm. Right. You didn't take a bath, bath or shower every day. Gosh, if unless you were ultra rich. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. but the normal person would only take a bath every two, three times a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a it was a big thing, you know, wow. to to take a bath. So uh, that was uh, in large part of, you know, our hygiene. Mm. I can't imagine. I mean, when I was in the hospital, the last time I took a shower was Friday morning, and then I had my heart attack and surgery. And following Wednesday, I had to take a shower mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I couldn't stand it anymore. Mike, and that's only see Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, five days. Right. And uh, goodness gracious, I can't imagine taking a shower ever two to th two or three times a year. My goodness gracious. Right. I know when I was in ICU for my brain surgery, uh -huh. I took a shower the third day. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was the third day. Yeah. And they, they got me up and, and said, okay, you got to shower and get all this yeah, going. Yeah. And I thought, oh, this is a chore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I, on that Saturday and Sunday, I was in there, Donna. And of course, I'm all hooked up with two IVs, one in each uh -huh. arm, and got the EKG, and I can't take a shower. And they considered me because they had me on blood thinner too to be a uh, a fall oh, yeah. risk or whatever. Had that yep. yellow band, you know. Can't get out of bed unless somebody's with me, you know. Okay. Yep, I remember that. Yeah, and then I had my surgery on Monday, November the first, this past uh, in 2021, and uh, <laughs> then I had a fib Wednesday night. That's fun. But anyway, <laughs> I'm getting way off on a on a personal thing. It's boring to people out there, and you know. The main thing is, I am so glad we can take a shower whenever we want to. Right. In fact, right before the show, you know, Donna shared with me that Edgy came in and he's going to take a shower and he's going to go out and get her some groceries. <laughs> and that's yeah, we're almost, real man. Right, because we're almost out of coffee. And in our house, that mm. means we're dead broke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's an unforgivable sin there, you know. Exactly right. <laughs> oh, my and I, goodness. And I had to laugh earlier because your little kitty came in. Was that Bullet or? No, that was uh, Glock. Glock. Okay. All right. You got to get them name tags or something, yeah, because. <laughs> <him again. laughs> well, Glock, yes, and, Glock and Bullet are both Bombay, so. Yeah. Uh, they're oh. both black. They, they look alike. Uh, Glock is, is uh, much smaller, uh, very petite. I love Bombay cats. My mm -hmm. good, they are, they're known, ladies and gentlemen, we got to get off topic here a little bit because we'll have some fun. Bombay cats are described as miniature black panthers. Yeah. I've been blessed in my life and had three oh, and uh, J man, my last one, mm. uh, of course he's passed, but at his largest, and I kid you not, he was 25 pounds. Mm. <laughs> He was a big boy and he'd climb up on the tree in Ohio out the, front, <laughs> uh -huh, out the front yard and you'd be walking in the front yard and it kind of startled you. You look up and he's just with those big yellow eyes just going, hey, what's up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We would go walking through our woods. I live out in the country and uh, our little girl, uh, her name was, uh, what the heck was the kitty's name? We lost her several years ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it almost came to him. Anyway, I can come to him in a minute. It's for we've had so many pets, my goodness gracious. Okay, Jim, you're muted. Um yeah, I uh I wish I could share this picture with you guys because this is this is adorable. My cat, J Man. I hmm. take my dog for a walk and I have a great Pyrenees. He's, he's white. He's rather large. He's four feet long. And it was hysterical because hmm. you'd see this big, long white dog and this big 25 pound cat walking side by side, happy as a clam. And everybody in the neighborhood be like, there she goes with her cat and her dog. <laughs> oh, goodness. Goodness. Jim, did you lose the little connection, buddy? <laughs> well, he's getting wired up. He's getting wired up. He hasn't had enough coffee today. So, 
anyway, so we are super, super excited about this because right after uh, the influenza hit, the Spanish influenza, mm -hmm. um, it came right into what, Jim? It came right into the roaring 20s. This is when people mm -hmm. said, enough, we're going to take charge of our lives. We're going to not only just, you know, survive, we're going to thrive. And we're you know, gonna have Donna, fun. we're gonna live. Oh yeah, the Roaring Twenties. My goodness gracious! You think of the Charleston. You think of yes. flappers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, but also too, there was some great inventions that came out of the twenties, and we're going to cover a few of them today. And we're going to cover, you know, a lot of them, you know, during the week, some each day. Right. And one other thing that came into was. Uh, you know, the, the convertible car, a lot of people don't realize that con all cars were just boxes back then, very square and all that. Right. And the very first time that I, well, when I think of a convertible old car like that, I think of Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> but it's, a, it's it. amazing. Oh yeah. And the invention actually came in 1922 because when automobiles were first invented, they came in the form of a horse drawn buggy with no roof right and and no no doors and windshields they were efficient but didn't have the comfort that we enjoy today then if it rained or snowed the passenger and driver and passenger would all get wet and if it sunned everyone got hot right so it's some time you know for it took some time for them to a guy by the name of Ellerbeck he was the one that designed and made his first convertible ever because in the, 1922 is when he did it. Uh huh. At the when time of the invention, the there were a few autom automobiles with closed roofs. Everything was open. So right. he made a convertible roof. I mean, so the convertible roof was actually before the hard top, <laughs> as we call it back in those days, right? Right. Isn't right. that something? <clears throat> well, it's kind of interesting because uh, you think about, you know, we, we don't often know like th three of these inventions the convertible and the next two we're going to talk about today. Mm. I have absolutely no clue that that's when they came. Oh, I me absolutely have no clue. You're going to be shocked during this week when we disclose when something was invented. I mean, you're going to like, you got to be kidding me. I thought that right. was decades later. Right. And one of my favorite things I love to see when I'm driving is traffic lights. <laughs> Okay, that was invented in 1923, folks. Mm -hmm. yep. And the inventor was William Potts. Hmm. I'm so glad he invented that thing, and I'll tell you why. Because if I'm going down the road and light screen, the closer I get to it, the more chances are that that sucker is going to turn yellow. Right. And <clears throat> I've went through, you know, I've went through sometimes, and every single light catches me. And then me and Evelyn and, and Lisa were going somewhere and I was hitting green light after green light after green light. And Lisa says, dad, you've been, you hadn't had any stoplights catch you. And I said, no, I must be living right. <laughs> I was just thinking that that's what my mom always used to say. And that's what I always say now. <laughs> yeah. So here's an interesting thing about William Pox though. He was a police officer hmm. and he lived in Detroit, Michigan. And hmm. he was always eager to help with traffic to move on. Um, so he was the one who came up with it and, uh, he, he first installed the lights at an intersection on a corner in Detroit, Michigan. Mm. And you could very easily understand why a police officer would see, Hey, there's a need for this because we got to stand out there in inclement weather. And what if people can't see us? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just one thing after another. My goodness gracious. You got to tip your hat to him. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Right. So yeah. also that in Ohio, um, Garrett, who mm -hmm. first owned an automobile in Cleveland, saw the need for traffic lights in the city. And he invented his version of it, which was a little bit different from Potts, mm -hmm. but patented it in 1923. So today, Pot's prototype has been developed over the years until date to help control traffic worldwide. Hmm. That is really something. And the moral of that story is you may be sitting there during these times. 
during these times of doom and gloom, you may have an inspirational idea that could really be a blessing to others. Uh, it may be an idea that you could be a, a trainer or a coach or help somebody in their hour of need because you may be the only person or that uh, several people, a group of people can relate to just for coaching and training. Right. Think about that. Or you may have an invention <clears throat> that could really help mankind. Something simple. Here's a police officer out there saying, hey, you know, if we had a traffic signal here, right. this would solve a lot of problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially, so, Jim, if the, especially if the poor traffic cop had to make a uh, nature call. You know, <laughs> think of, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just had to That's add okay. that. Well, it's kind of interesting because uh, looking through this, you know, so, okay, 1920, uh, 1920s was when the traffic light uh, be became, mm -hmm. okay, when was the first headrest invented for cars? Mm. Now, this one here shocked me. I know the answer to that because Donna gave me her cheat sheet, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but if someone would have asked me, when was a headrest invented in a car? Right. I would have thought 50s or maybe 60s. Right. But the year was 1921. Yep. That, Inventor that really, Benjamin Katz, K-A-T-Z. Yeah. yeah. And the headrest is the extension of the automobile seat, as we know, that accommodates the head and the neck. It was not much of a concern when automobiles were first made. It took the invention by Benjamin Katz, K-A-T-C, in 1921 to invent the first headrest in the automobile. Before the invention of the headrest and other uh, barrels um, in the automobile, automobile accidents could easily damage the head and the neck right? because the head is standing free. That was why. It wasn't and there for look or to look cool. No. It was it was there for a health and safety reason. Correct. But it was interesting because it goes on to say in this article that although it started uh, his headrest started featuring in automobiles year years later, starting with the Volvo brand, mm. it became a safety feature for every automobile owner. Now, what's really amazing about that, ladies and gentlemen, if you think about safety in your car, let's take airbags and put them aside for right now. Because air, airbags didn't come on the scene until the 70s or something, or maybe 80s. I don't remember when they came on the scene, but which would be more important, a headrest or seat belts? <laughs> right. You, you think about that. But he focused in on one area of where people could, you know, their necks could get injured or the head or whatever because they might be rear-ended or, you know, have something to help their head, support their head. But then someone else says, hey, we need seat belts. Right. And you can easily, and then another person, you know, or, or then, then came the airbags. Right. But it was interesting because the statistics showed then uh, at that time that that movement of putting in and inventing headrests Mm -hmm. It helped uh, the high risk of head and neck injuries be reduced in an accident for up to 10%. Wow. So that, that was pretty, that's pretty big. It really is. It really is. And when you talk about the roaring 20s, my goodness gracious, I mean, people wanted to live, people wanted to thrive, people wanted to just, you know, Enjoy the love and abundance of life. I mean, let's right. crank it up and turn it on. I mean, we talked Not be about afraid the, to go outside. That's right. Because in the Western society and Western culture, this was a period of, of economic prosperity with a distinctive cultural edge in the United States, Europe, and particularly in major cities like Berlin, Chicago, London, Los Angeles, New York, Paris, and Sydney. And in France, the decade was known as the and as follies, which is crazy years. <laughs> right. But that's really, that's really amazing because in big cities like that, they set the standard for everybody else because they were able to get information in, in newspapers, radio, and we're going to cover something else later on this week, but I'm going to give you a little snapshot. 
Television was invented in the 20s. Mm -hmm. That's another one that kind of like, whoa. Right. I thought that was maybe 40s, <laughs> you know. I didn't see any TVs till I was about 10 or 12 years old, something like that. Well, and maybe guess what eight. Else? I'm sorry. Guess what else was invented that is used all over the world now in 1923? In 1923. Okay. Oh, I know what you're going to say. Lay it on us. Bulldozers. Bulldozers. <laughs> right? So the inventor was James Cunning and Earl McLeod. Mm -hmm. So they were used in construction sites, mines, farmlands, etc. Before 1920, a few tractor designs had emerged and were used on extensive farms. So uh, both them came, uh, from Kansas City invented the first bulldozer. It was made of large. Uh, it was made of a large pushing blade attached to the tractor with controls. Mm -hmm. Their first design was aided by a farmland tractor, uh, but they needed a powerful machine to help the front blades move heavy materials. So the only option was a tractor. So, and of course, now we see how bulldozers have evolved and changed and gotten better. Oh, my goodness gracious, yes. They saw a need for that. I mean, think about all the, man, the manual labor that that saved, the manpower. Oh, right? my goodness gracious. So in 1925, they received their patent on it, too. Mm. So you can imagine that uh, uh, that was a, a real fine, smart move on their part. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah you're exactly right. And, you know, Don, as we talk about these, you know, the events and some of the inventions that, you know, came about during that time. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about. I mean, maybe tomorrow, because uh, we're running a little, uh, we're, we're not running low on time, but we want to say some things for tomorrow. But like we talked about <clears throat> the flu, you know, and guess what came along? Penicillin was invented. Right. And penicillin was very instrumental, instrumental in helping me as a young boy overcome pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm very grateful for that. But it just goes to show you where there's a need. Uh, what's that old saying? Uh, a, a need is a mother invention or whatever. I, I forget. The... Uh, oh, hang on now. <laughs> you made me forget. Yeah, I, I do that to people. I, I, I goof yeah, things up. Yeah, you do, and... Jim. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> mother is the, uh, uh, and, and, let's see. Need is the mother of all invention, I think. There it there is. There go. it is. Yeah, there we go. Okay, Between let's both talk about something really important to just about all of us throughout the world that we all love and adore. Okay. Came about in 1924. All right. The cheeseburger. Mm. That's when the cheeseburger was invented by Lionel Sternberger. Every restaurant had a hamburger before a cheeseburger, which was common, mm -hmm. but the cheeseburger was made in Pasadena at a roadside stand operated by the inventor's father. The mm. stand was situated on 1500 West Colorado Street, and it was named the right spot. Mm. Lionel Sternberger made the cheeseburger in his father's stand at the request of a customer. Mm. The customer said he wanted cheese on his dish of hamburger, so he added it, and it tasted good. So he got interested in continuing the delicacy. Mm -hmm. After the first cheeseburger was made, he added the food on their menu so anyone could uh, order it. Mm -hmm. Interesting, huh? It really is. And all of these inventions we've mentioned before, think about all of the fear that people had in their minds, these inventors. Fear that it may not work. Fear that it may wind up like uh, Fulton's Folly, where it's an embarrassment to them. Right. Fear that, uh, you know, someone will laugh at them or it would just be a just a total flop. Or fear that it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be accepted, that they go broke. Uh, you know, that's just common for us. Every time we want to start out on a new project, immediately all of these fears and worries and things Come into our mind, don't they, Donna? Oh, Lord. Yeah. And we can't help it. 
Mm -hmm. can't help it. We're just human. So we do that. And, you know, we have to consciously stop ourselves from doing that. I know I do. Mm -hmm. When I've got a lot on my plate, I have to say, okay, you're getting really stressed out about this, Donna. There's no need to be stressed. You know, Mm -hmm. it's it's all what's going to be is meant to be. That's it's right. out of my control, right? Mm-hmm. So, because all it does is rob me of right now what's right in front of me. Mm-hmm. It sure you know? does. And, and when I get too stressed, obviously, uh, with anybody, it affects our body, affects the way our mood is, it affects our everything, our whole DNA. Mm-hmm. It sure does. And the thing, too, is that, uh, like Donna said, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. That's why you want to make options instead of decisions. Right. Because if you make decisions, you've already got the end result, you know, carved in stone. And no matter if the options are or or the 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 energy is pulling you away from your decision and you did not make options, you're going to try to force everything to fit to finish the project. Correct. That's what induces stress. That's what induces you know, getting aggravated, upset, losing sleep, uh, all the things that, you know, robbed you of your creativity, your health, your lifestyle, your everything. So this is why you make options. Okay. That didn't work too. Okay. We try this here. In fact, Donna and I, and a couple other folks, we're working on a, a big project right now. And we just, you know, we asked them, okay, what do you think about this? The people who, that we're working with and for, (laughs) and, if they give us the okay, we go forward. If not, guess what we do with that option? Pew. Throw it out the window. Yep. Next. It's just that simple. And that way we remain focused on the target and we don't get overly stressed over little things that we had no control over anyway. Right. And one of the best guys, we say this a lot practically every show because this is critical. There's people out there that need to hear this. And we talk a lot about my good friend, Mr. Bill Heinrich, the truelifepurposenow.com website, because Bill will give you a complimentary 30-minute session of what's blocking you, what's holding you back. He's a master at that because his book, The Seven Levels of Truth, and I say Bill is a friend of ours, we don't get any compensation for this, but that's his book right there, The Seven Levels of Truth. I think I got that centered. And there is Mr. Bill's picture right there. And this was 25 years in the making. Right. He was a guy that was miserable. He was a guy that walked away from his life. The only thing he took from his past life was his name. That was it. And he went on a journey to find himself. And when he did, he realized that he would be able to. Okay, Donna's got some, I noticed she had some internet problems, so, but she'll be back with us as quickly as she can. But Bill realized that what he had was so valuable, he had to share it with others. And that's very important in life because in your lifestyle, you've got certain gifts and talents that I or no one else on planet Earth has. Your calling in life as you travel down your pathway of life is to be able to find how you can use those gifts, those talents, and those blessings to be a blessing to others. That's when you're living, that's when you're thriving, and that's when you are enjoying the abundance that the universe has to offer. That was one of the things that took me a long time to understand, how the universe is just full of love and abundance. That's why we were created. It's that simple. We weren't created to, you know, work and worry and do all those things. We we do that pretty good on our own, don't we? <laughs> but most importantly, you know, it's important for us to remember that when we when we struggle and when we fail, not to sound negative, but let's talk realistically here. When we struggle and fail in the past, I've struggled and failed many times, but it always gnawed at me. It bothered me. It's kind of like I wish that hadn't happened kind of a deal. But when you love yourself and you say, I'm going to forgive myself for that. I'm not going to let that one thing that happened or a couple of things that happened rob me of my health and my happiness and my journey. It's not worth it. 
Think of it like I always like to think of like a baseball player. For the, some of you folks in the over overseas may not be familiar with baseball, but if a baseball player can get up to the plate. And he's got a 350 batting average, okay? And the fan, and he can hit 40 home runs a year and still 40 bases. To the fans of that team, he is a hero. He is a champion. He is a winner. And think about this. That means 350 times he, he out of a thousand times. He's either going to he's going to get on base, either a single, double, triple, home run, whatever. Okay, that's how he establishes a 350 batting average. But when you take that out of a thousand, that means what? 650 times out of a thousand, he fails. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Donna, we're so glad to have you back. Glad your uh, your internet's working better. But it's amazing how we can let one failure derail us or enslave us. Ooh. Or worse, devastate us to where we don't try again, Jim. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Because failure is nothing more than a lesson learned. Yeah, That's it. exactly. That's yeah. all it is. It's nothing more than a lesson learned. And that going forward from there, you know what the right and how to make it better you're absolutely correct and when you accept it as a lesson learned because you look at things in life okay what went well right and then what was the lesson i learned here okay and then if you admit to others okay uh, i learned a lesson here everybody's going to relate to that they can connect to you mm -hmm. because a lot of times people try and pretend that that lesson they learned never happened mm-hmm and that phoniness comes across the, you know, whatever, whatever program you're looking at. There's something about the camera. The camera does not lie. When I say right. I'm 73, the camera proves that I'm telling the truth. <laughs> well, the thing, the thing is, Jim, I know a lot of very successful people as well as you do. Mm -hmm. And there isn't one of them who would tell you that they succeeded right from the get go. Oh, no, 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 no. It's think about how what a terrible per person you would be if you never failed. Think about that. I mean, because failure has a way of keeping us humble. Mm -hmm. Failure has a way of helping us realize that we're human and we're not perfect. But think about if everything you touch turned to gold, as the old saying goes, and you never failed and all that, you'd be so puffed up with pride, you'd probably float on air, you know? <laughs> well, look at it. From from our earliest uh, our earliest time in life, we succeed and fail. Think about this. Let's go back to when you start walking, your children start walking, oh, right? Yeah. They don't just get up one day and just take off, mm -mm. right? They crawl first. Right. Mm -hmm. Then then they, you know, stand up a little bit and mm -hmm. then they start walking and they fall down and they walk and fall down till one day they gain their balance mm. and then the fun begins. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing how that happens, you know, and it's it, it just you know, that's a great analogy because when a kid fails or falls, they don't take that seriously. No. No. Not at all. This is kind of like just an brush it whoops. off without yeah. even knowing it. They don't even think about it. No, they no. don't even Not think about all. it because their mind is on the target. You know, yeah, I want to walk. I want to be like everybody else. Their I see mind you walking. is in the present, not mm -hmm. the past. There you go. What Donna said, she said it better <laughs> than I did. <laughs> that is so true because when we get caught up in our minds, our minds are focused on what Donna past. We're the past that's all they can remember is bring up the past right and the past can be a good thing because if you hear a song it takes you back to a time you know like uh our good friend uh, marty haggard uh, his dad's best but probably a number one what well, definitely a number one hits the most requested song when marty performs and silver wings silver wings yes ma'am makes silver me cry wings. every time oh goodness gracious and i when i've first met Marty, 
I saw him perform and I went up to him and of course he's such a genuine guy down to earth good friend of he ours is, he is so beautiful just a wonderful yeah. person yeah him and his wife Tess are just fantastic uh -huh. people and I told Marty about the silver wings and you know I've heard the song before and I liked it but where it really made a, an impression with me and when it when the kind of like what the old saying is when the chickens came home to roost for me, right? My son was on his first deployment to Afghanistan in 2002. This is after 911, after obviously. And we left the the plant, the my, our manufacturing business. And he was with his mom. His mom hopped in the truck with him to ride with him. And so I got out and I closed it. You know, pulled out there and closed the gate and all that and hopped in the truck going to follow them. And as soon as I got in the truck to crank, you know, to put it in gear and go, silver wings came on and oh man, you can imagine how I felt with my son oh, going to war for the first time because I'm a Vietnam veteran and I know what it feels like. Right. Because news, when that plane lifts up and the wheels are off the ground, you know, this is for real. Right. But you don't know what you're going to walk into. Exactly. You're going into an unknown. Yes, ma'am. And that was a that was a big unknown back then. At least when I oh. went to Vietnam in 69, 70, it's a little bit known. <laughs> right. But, but uh, it's that's amazing because, yeah, Silver Wings is, uh, you know, that's, that's what our memory can do for us. That's what our mind can do to us. And when I say do to us, do for us, I should say, because right. anytime you fail, reflect back when you did fall and think about how you survived, how you overcome that and how, you know, you can use that as a blessing in your life for strength. Right. And what's amazing to me is we think back about it. This is something that really gets me. We, uh, what'd you do? Was that the kitty? Uh, it's a different one. This is Niner 210 Tessie. Niner. Okay. <laughs> She has a clouder of cats in her house. I we do. learned that we learned that new word yesterday, didn't we? Or not yesterday, uh, Friday. Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a clouder of cats. That's and a have had pretty much my life. <laughs> yeah, C L O W D E R is clouder, and it means if you got three cats or more in your house, in addition to having a cat house, you got a clouder house. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh goodness, and. Uh, you know, Donna, when we think about, you know, five years ago, we were worried about something. Oh, yeah. Because it's just part of life. We worry about this. We may not sit and ponder on it and be scared to death about it, but we always have these little doubts and things that want to shoot arrows into our minds and try to derail us and rob us of our health, our happiness, and our energy. And oh, rob goodness us gracious. of our hope. Mm -hmm. Yes. Rob us of our hope. And you should not allow anything or anyone, mm -hmm. including yourself, That's to right. rob you of your hope. Yeah, sometimes you can be your own worst enemy, can't you? Oh, good gracious. Because what we tell ourselves, what we hear is we tell ourselves the most, mm -hmm. right? More than any other person. <laughs> now, even the cat agreed with that. That's cat approved. <laughs> That is cat approved. Hold that baby up there. Let's see. Uh, she can. just jumped down. She's awful she? big. Hang on. Yeah. Okay. Here she goes. This is. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Charcoal gray. <laughs> yeah. She's a Russian blue. Mm. Oh, she's, yeah. Yeah. My daughter a had a Russian blue. blue. Yeah. Goodness yeah, two gracious. Two Bombays, a Russian blue, and a Siamese. <sighs> Mercy. <laughs> Right. We, want, we wanted one of those big old, I love them, the big old yellow and white cats, a male. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. But we, we couldn't find one when we were looking for kittens. And mm. so we got four and we decided that was enough. Oh, my goodness keep the, gracious. Keep the numbers yeah. even. <laughs> yeah. Because I would love to have me another uh, little, uh, you know, little Black Panther, a little Bombay. Oh, those kitties are something else. Cause they are amazing. Oh, and, you know, it's funny because they are actually very gentle. Um, they seldom put their claws out. Right, right. <laughs> but, but Niner, this one right here, 
she's got some hefty claws and she doesn't mind letting you know that she she can use them excuse me <laughs> i gotta tell you something funny that came to my mind when you were talking about that our little black you know bombay kitty her name was tigger you look out the back and the, the, i live in the country look out in the backyard you see tigger Five minutes later, you look in the front yard, you see Tigger. She was like a little ninja on patrol. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. serious about their domain. Oh, absolutely. And they're, they're jet black. They have a kind of like a shiny coat and not one white hair on them anywhere. And they'll their eyes have, are... They'll, hmm? Sometimes they'll, they'll have a, a brownish tint to them. Yes, yes. Because they're actually were bred. I did not know this for the longest time. They're bred with Burmese. Mm -hmm. a short hair black cat and mm -hmm. uh, a Burmese and that's yeah. why a lot of the black cats have that undercoat that's a little bit brown right right and uh, <clears throat> and she was a character I mean we'd see her chasing squirrels up a tree mm -hmm. down a tree yep up another tree and then the squirrel would go jumping from limb to limb and that's when Tigger had the attitude that's cheating just a minute. That's cheating, you know, because Tigger would take out after them. And one time she got on the roof. I had just uh, tarred around the roof, you know, put the tar around the seal, the roof and all in the places around the vents and all that. So she gets up there and evidently she got in the tar and I didn't know it. So she comes back down. She comes in the house. I got on a sweatshirt because it's fall of the year. And she gets up on me and she's kneading me and kneading me and kneading me the way they do. And I thought, oh, that was sweet. All she was doing was cleaning her feet on my sweatshirt. I'm going, had all these dark footprints on it. I'm going like, Tigger, that, you know, you know, she's you know, that's, stupid. that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's the best looking, you know, doormat that she's probably saw in a long time since, yeah. You know, I remember yeah. J-Man because he was so dadgum big. And he had a big old belly. And uh, of course, I don't, for me, not populating the world with my animals. So I, you know, spay and neuter my animals. Mm -hmm. And he came to us already neutered. And he was a stray that, that my daughter found. And he was an amazing cat. But he was so big and his belly was so low to the ground. And he just walked real slow. Like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm here. So you wouldn't think that he could get up and move. But boy, if he saw a bird he wanted to go after, I have seen him jump flight and go about four feet in the air and catch a bird. Boom, just like that. <laughs> oh, my squirrel, goodness bowls, gracious. Bats. He's killed bats. He brought me a snake. Um, you name it. He's, he's mm -hmm. killed it. Mice. That was his favorite. He, oh, yeah. He gets the mice and play with them. <laughs> oh, yeah. I tell you, you know, it's, it's amazing how they are. Because when they give you a gift like that, it's a gift. You know, they're, they're, look what I did. I'm, I brought this for you. If you could have seen how proud he was bringing me that dadgum garter snake. <laughs> and that you sucker know, was probably about, I don't know, 12, 14 inches long, easy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. he climbed, he would climb our chain link fence. Mm -hmm. So he's climbing this chain link fence with something in his mouth. And it was a snake. Right. I'm not making this up. And I, I didn't, I had my sunglasses on, of course, no bifocals in them. So I'm like, I can't quite see what he's got. So I walk up to him and I see the snake and I'm like, ah, oh, for heaven's sakes, J man. I said, drop the snake. And he looked at me with these big orange or yellow eyes and went, <laughs> drop the snake. He'd only stunned it. Thank goodness. He, he yeah. didn't kill it. And so, you know, we let it go. And of course, my daughter wanted to keep it. I'm like, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, around here, I see a gardener snake from time to time, a little yellow ribbon snake. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have the Texas rat snake here, which is referred to as a chicken snake. Them things can scare you. And the oh, reason like I a, say that, mm -hmm. because they're, they get to be very long. They get six feet long, no problem. Like a bull snake. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And they yeah. can climb trees. I've told people that they can climb trees and people say, oh, you're nuts. Yes, they can. <laughs> they can flat dab kind of, because one time I was out in my woods. And of course, I'm looking on the ground because we've got copperheads here too. Now, copperhead right. snakes are very, 
they're not like a rattlesnake. They're not, they're not aggressive at all. They're kind of laid back, easy going, you know, okay, fine. But you can't you know, see them and that's when you get in trouble. Yeah. So I'm looking around like this, you know, going through my woods, all those leaves and stuff. And out of the corner of my eye, because I'm wood wise, you know, I just developed that trait, gift, whatever you want to call it. When I was in Vietnam, you, you, you're always, you're, you might be looking here, but you're also looking there. Your peripheral vision gets really right. honed. And I saw something out of the ordinary and I looked to my right <laughs> and about 18 inches from my face is a snake looking at me, laying on a limb. I go, oh, thank you very much for waking me up today. It was right? a, uh, it was a Texas rat snake. And, uh, of course, they're not a, they're not poisonous or anything, but they will strike at you if you mess with them. Absolutely. And, uh, they but then <laughs> it's kind of funny. We've been talking about a lot of things tomorrow. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about some more about the roaring twenties. We're going to talk about the, the automobiles, the radios, the cinema. We're going to get into that and uh, we're going to have some fun because, uh, goodness gracious, there is so much there because as you listen to the stories here, think about what you can do to go from survival to thrival. Mm -hmm. And mm. the interesting thing for me about the Roaring Twenties mm. is the inventions that happened. Oh, yeah. We use today. Yeah. Right? That's We, we don't think about the correlation of when they were invented and mm. what it was like during that time. Oh, yeah. That it's really amazing. amazing. Mm -hmm. It really is because people had an idea and they wanted to, you know, sell it and make some money. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you need to do the same thing too, especially if you're, you know, for folks has been, you know, of course by now people are starting to, if you've either reacted or you should have already reacted to, you know, the pandemic, the repercussions of it and all that, but your greatest story hasn't been told yet. Think about that. Right. You got a long ways to go Absolutely. and we're out of time, weren't we? We are, we have to go, but we will be back tomorrow mm -hmm. and learning more about the boring 20 folks with yeah. the inventions mm -hmm. that we are so blessed mm -hmm. oh, to have yeah. in our life today. Yeah. And Donna's going to uh, show us how to do the Charleston tomorrow too. So be sure. No, to I'm not. <laughs> 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 well, if I, I get to Charleston, you have to dress up as a flapper. How about that? Mm. Uh, I don't look too good with my flap open. <laughs> yeah, I could just, I don't, don't even visualize that because that's not even close to me, you know. Uh, mm, just well, we thank flapper. you, each and every one of you, for being with us yeah. today and every day as always. We hope that you are blessed and have a wonderful day or evening ahead of you. And we will see you tomorrow. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we hope that you and your loved ones are all blessed in all areas of your life. Remember to love yourself first, and then you can love others. Most importantly now, remember what we talk about every single show about forgiving yourself, because that is so important and so critical. And no, I will not dress up like a dapper Dan tomorrow or anything like that. No top hat, no cane. You know, I'm not <laughs> going to put on the Ritz or anything. <laughs> That's a little bit later anyway. But anyway, <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow, folks. Have a good one. Bye-bye.